Welcome to another episode of Count Me In. I'm your host, Adam Larson, and today I'm thrilled to have Frank Tumiello, CEO of FileForms, join me to discuss the Corporate Transparency Act and its impact on businesses across the United States. With millions of companies required to file the beneficial ownership information reports by the end of the year, Frank and I will explore the lack of awareness surrounding this new federal compliance requirement and the potential consequences for non-compliance. Throughout our conversation, we'll cover the various filing options available, the details required in the BOI report, exemptions that may apply, and the responsibilities of beneficial owners in ensuring compliance. Whether you're a business owner or simply interested in staying informed about the corporate compliance, this episode is for you. Should join us as we learn more about the Corporate Transparency Act. Well, Frank, I'm really excited to have you on the Count Me In podcast today. And today we're going to be talking a lot about the Corporate Transparency Act. And, you know, as the CEO of File Forms, you know a lot about this. And as we were talk- chatting before this, uh, before this podcast, you know, you guys mentioned that there's 32 million companies that still need to file reports. And that's a huge number. Is that an expected number? And, and why is it so large? Yeah, it is a huge, uh, a huge number, Adam. We're expecting uh, quite a bit of uh, BOI reports to be filed by, by the end of the year. Um, you know, we, we, we actually unpacked how FinCEN, who, uh, who's the government agency regulating this new uh, beneficial ownership information reporting choir- requirement, we unpacked specifically how they came up with that 32.6 uh, million uh, reporting company number. And we actually believe that number to be drastically understated, mm-hmm. um, largely due to the methodology that they used in calculating um, kind of an entity per capita across states. They used kind of an average of across 10 states and, and, and um, was able to kind of derive a ratio to, to kind of estimate what uh, the, the reporting population would look like nationwide. So um, we actually think the, the, the real number is probably close to 40 million businesses. Um, and it's pretty remarkable because that number is going to continue to grow um, any given year especially since the pandemic where you see a lot of freelancers and side hustlers and you know folks becoming more and more entrepreneurial as they either unfortunately got laid off from their corporate jobs or maybe maybe just got fed up with it because of you know working remotely or need to go back into the office we're seeing more and more legal entities formed any given year up to 400 to 500,000 per month uh, so effectively, those businesses are largely all going to be reporting companies. So not only is there a huge need to file initially uh, a BOI report for all pre-existing entities, but every month there's going to be, you know, uh, a few hundred thousand uh, new businesses formed that also need to file, which will add to that number. Yeah, it will continue to grow. Now, do you think there's a big lack of awareness that they even need to file? Um, is there is there and is there a gap between those who need to file and those who are actually aware that they need to file too? Certainly, a huge gap of awareness. Um, you know, I think an interesting stat is just the number of BOI reports that have been filed year to date so far. So here we are in late June. Uh, effectively, fifty percent of the of the year has gone by. Yet only about two million BOI reports have been filed to date. So that's less than five percent of um, you know, the 32.6 million that are expected or even the 40 million that we expect. Um, so I believe the reason for that is because of lack of awareness. And the reason why I think that is the case is because our team is speaking with uh, CPAs, law firms, uh, directly with small businesses, family offices, real estate investment companies. And we are laying down the initial knowledge base for these folks who have quite a bit of filing on their hands in the next six months. Um, so it's it's certainly a need for folks to become more aware of this law. And I think one of the, the primary reasons why people uh, aren't aware of it is largely because of inertia. And what do I mean by that? It's, it's because this is new. They've never had to do this before to run their business. Um, they're not looking for uh, new federal compliance requirements. There's just not that many of them outside of call it filing your, your taxes with the IRS. So um, obviously everyone knows the IRS. We've, we've had to report to the IRS as business owners for, for many, many years and as individuals. However, FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, once again, that, that uh, agency of the US Treasury who's now regulating uh, the BOI reporting uh, across our nation, they're just not a well-known agency whatsoever. 
Businesses have never even heard of FinCEN. They think it's only for financial institutions or, or real estate companies that need to report. Um, so if you look at FinCEN across all of their social media platforms, they only have 18,000 total file followers. Uh, so compare that number to the 40 million businesses that need to file. It's a starkingly, uh, you know, big gap that, you know, I think, um, you know, all their efforts are, are great to, to educate, but at the same time, it's just uh, not, not broad, broadly enough spread, unfortunately. All right. So let's say you're listening to this podcast and you realize, oh no, I need to report, you know, what are your options? You know, how do you choose the best approach for your organization? Yeah, I think um, the, the first step is just looking yourself in the mirror, really, and, and determining are you the type of business owner that's a do-it-yourselfer or are you the type of business owner that's really looking to, you know, spend every minute of your time in the most efficient way possible? Um, you know, obviously, you know, depending on the size of your business, um, your set of responsibilities could vary quite significantly. Uh, so can your support staff. So um, if you are kind of a, a younger business running, um, you know, a little bit more lean, then perhaps you might want to a, attempt to file your BOI report on your own and, and save a few dollars. Um, you know, there there is a, an ability to do that directly on the government portal. FinCEN has a website that you can go on to and file for free. Though I will say, uh, if you choose to go that that route, there are a few considerations that you should take into account. And um, primarily is the fact that um, this is a new complex reporting requirement. FinCEN is not providing you really a, a, a guided tour of how to file this BOI report in real time. They're basically providing you uh, 95 pages plus of government jargon that you'll have to read over and determine your reporting obligations effectively on your own. And then a, a very static uh, PDF looking portal uh, for you to, to simply disclose your information, which is somewhat of an error prone process given the nature of the data that needs to be collected. This is very sensitive information. We're talking about government IDs, pictures of the ID, social security numbers, EINs in some instances. So um, not exactly the type of information you wanna be sending over email or text message. Unfortunately, FinCEN you know, is, is really kind of putting that onus completely on the beneficial owners who need to aggregate this information um, and not giving a ton of support if questions do arise. So um, one of the other alternatives to filing a BOI report is working with companies like us, um, FileForms. Um, you know, FileForms is able to take the FinCEN process, which takes you know two to three hours per entity in many cases, down to uh, about a 10 minute filing experience. So there's a huge time saving. If you are one of those business owners, that's like, you know what? I just wanna do this right. The liability is too great. You know, if you mess this up, this is a $10,000 fine per legal entity. So many a times people have several legal entities kind of making up their corporate structure. That $10,000 fine is gonna, you know, apply to all those legal entities if, for example, you, you don't disclose a beneficial owner correctly or you misrepresent the company information in some way. So having a, a, a partner in filing um, such as file forms that, you know, one saves you, you know, hours of time and two can prevent a ton of liability just for a few hundred dollars in filing. Uh, many folks believe that to be a no brainer. And then furthermore, if you are a CPA or an attorney who has a variety of different clients and a, a whole, um, perhaps portfolio of clients that need to need to file these BOI reports by the end of the year, you're going to want kind of a central repository where you can store all that information because changes will happen. And uh, the nature of this law is very unique in that this is not an annual filing. This is not a filing that's done kind of scheduled annually throughout the year. This is a perpetual monitoring of the data type of disclosure. So uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, you disclose your information once, and if anything on your form information wise changes uh, throughout the year, such as an address or someone gets married and their name changes or a C-suite executive turns over or gets hired, any of those things that happen all of the time for businesses, those changes will need to be disclosed within 30 days of the change happening, which is a pretty tight window in the realm of tax disclosure or other types of federal or state information disclosure. Um, so to have a, a technology solution, once again, that can automate some of the reminders and monitoring and the storage specifically of that data and also the aggregating of that data, um, you know, being able to disclose IDs securely directly to our platform rather than 
you know, potentially compromising them via email or, or text message. Uh, those are some of the features that we provide uh, for, for a, a marginally uh, more expensive cost than free, but at the same time, uh, we believe it to be a very clear value proposition and a, and a very fair value for, uh, you know, the risk that we mitigate with our technology. Now, sometimes when people see, hear something like a corporate transparency act, they're like, well, I'm not a public company. This doesn't apply to me, but it sounds like that that's not the case here. That's right. Um, so public companies do not have to file a BOI report. And why is that? Well, uh, the government already knows who owns uh, public companies because it's public. These companies are traded on on large stock exchanges and, and that information is disclosed in real time. The premise of this law is really to, to gain uh, insights into who owns all these anonymous shell companies throughout our nation uh, that ultimately have been formed uh, in a very uh, kind of... Um, hard to identify of way, um, you know, who the beneficial owners ultimately are. Uh, many states don't require uh, managers or members of, of legal entities to be disclosed at the point of formation. And that unfortunately has led the U.S. to be uh, slowly becoming a safe haven for um, shielding assets, um, hiding assets for tax purposes, money laundering in many instances. Folks are now using these shell companies nefariously to hide those transactions, hide those assets, um, and the U.S., I think, has reached its tipping point because, unfortunately, money laundering is a multi-trillion dollar a year issue for the U.S. economy. It's a huge drag on our GDP. And, um, you know, since the G many of the G7 uh, countries throughout the world have actually uh, implemented this BOI reporting standard, the U.S. is actually one of the late movers. So now, um, finally, the U.S. is elevating the reporting standards and, and hopefully can help prevent some of that money laundering. Wow. I mean, it, it's it's one of those things you hear about in movies a lot, but it is something that really happens. And certainly, I hope that maybe this this reporting standard will actually kind of root out some of those, those money laundering things. But I guess until the until the time has passed, you know, we'll, 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 how long will it take? Do you think we'll actually see some turnover in that? Yeah, you know, it's it's difficult to say. I think, you know, the government has been, you know, we interface with FinCEN weekly at this point, practically, and ask them a whole bunch of questions. And, you know, one of the questions we want to ask on behalf of our clients is when 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 do these fines really kick in? I mean, they're 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 huge fines. Um, they're they're certainly weighing on the folks that are that are aware. Uh, but thus far, you know, the, the government's been, you know, kind of taking the high road, which is, you know, we're just focused on kind of purveying this database of of all the, the beneficial owners and their affiliated uh, reporting companies. And, and once we have kind of, um, you know, the lion's share of the database built, perhaps then they'll start kind of making examples of, of folks who did or did not file uh, correctly. So, um, you know, it's tough to say from a timing standpoint, but I think initially uh, there's just an imminent need to, to kind of get the initial disclosure, get it all into a database. And then ultimately the government's going to store that database privately. Certain uh, government agencies will have access to it. Um, certain select financial institutions will have access to it for diligence purposes. Um, and that's how they're going to try to help prevent that money laundering is, is having a database and, and probably a blacklist across reference against it to, to kind of make examples of, you know, who's, who's not getting compliant. Now you've mentioned a few times like uh, IDs and stuff like that. What what are the details that are include in this report? Because it seems like it's pretty intimate information that they want about the companies and the and the officers. Yeah, it's pretty complex information, especially um, you know if there are many beneficial owners. There's no limit to how many beneficial owners uh, there can be. Um, so you know many many businesses might find they have 10, 20 beneficial owners, if not more. So um, you know if there are Kind of more folks around around the table, if you will, the the complexity does does get elevated. Furthermore, you know, legal structures tend to be fairly complicated. You know, sometimes there's multi tiers of you know LLCs and and hold codes and and different blockers and kind of the private equity world, for example. Um, so really, unpacking the corporate structure is another component of it. But effectively, you know, businesses will 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 you know have to disclose their their company legal name, their their DBA or doing business as name or trade name, if you will, their address, their jurisdiction of formation, and then ultimately their EIN or their you know unique tax identifier. And then the beneficial owners will have to disclose their legal names, their date of birth, their residential address, their unique number on their government issued ID, and then also an actual image of the government issued ID, which includes a driver's license or passport, 
Um, so they're certainly um, kind of taking the, the the most critical data, if you will, from from those individuals to assure that they have a good sense of who they are, where they where they spend their time, and and uh, ultimately which reporting companies they're affiliated with. Now that just that sounds like a lot of information placed in a government database, and it just how safe is this is this database going to be and i i you may not have the answer to that but it just it seems kind of risky to put all that information in one place yeah you know certainly we hope that the government is taking all the necessary uh security protocols uh to ensure that this data once it's collected is is stored securely but i just want to kind of double back to the statement i made before when i was describing how to file um I would not say that the government has taken every precaution towards the actual uh, security of aggregating the data, because once again, their system does not send links uh, to the beneficial owners to securely upload information. Uh, they do not allow you to store the information uh, securely so that you can kind of only have to make a single update, for example, as opposed to have to fill out the form all again. Um, so, you know, when there are changes, the the folks who choose to go the free route with the government portal, they're going to have to start from a blank form again. And really, they're going to have to store that information somewhere on their own hard drive or USB or uh, floppy disk if people still use those. But um, nonetheless, um, you know, having having kind of an encrypted database um, that can aggregate the information securely um, and, uh, you know, have a secure back end. Uh, that, that's what our technology is. Um, and once again, I hope at least on the back end side of things, the government is taking all the necessary protocols. But I wouldn't say the updates from FinCEN have gone into very many details on exactly how they're approaching that. Mm -hmm. I mean, floppy disk might be the most secure thing nowadays because you can't hack a floppy disk unless you that's have it. That's a good it. point. That's a good point. You just got to figure out how to get them in our laptops these days. They've gotten so <laughs> tiny. <laughs> that is very true. That is very true. Now, who in the company is is responsible for making sure that this report is filed? Because it's a company level obligation, but who who in the organization should be responsible for that? You know, the 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 obligation really falls you know to the company, and then kind of through the company to the beneficial owners. So ultimately, the beneficial owners are the ones responsible for for directing the filing. Um, you know, the beneficial owners are the one who you know, for example, could could kind of authorize someone like File Forms to do the work for them or authorize a CPA or an attorney to do it. Um, I will say spending, you know, attorney level rates on, on doing this type of work is, is a little bit, I'd say aggressive and unnecessary. You wouldn't have your attorney pay, you know, your cable bill, for example. So, you know, you probably could, um, you know, find a, a service provider that's slightly more reasonable rate to get this done just as eloquently, if not more so, because this is what we do every single day. Um, but, um, you know, generally speaking, you know, I think folks will will take a variety of different approaches to to kind of filing and, um, you know, hopefully do it in the most secure way. So are there any exemptions? Because a lot many times when these government uh, mandated uh, requirements come out, there are exemptions are in the case of the corporate transparency. Are, are there exemptions? There are 23 extremely specific exemptions. Um, we actually have already covered a couple of them, such as if you're a publicly traded company, um, you would not have to disclose. There's another uh, exemption that I think is is pretty prevalent uh, to be considered at least, which is the large company exemption that actually has uh, three parameters that need to be met. The company has to have at least 5 million or more of revenue on a previous tax return. It also has to have 20 or more full-time employees working at the business. And furthermore, the third parameter would be having a physical operating presence in the United States. So if all three are met, then the company is deemed a large operating company and the government feels that they have enough uh, understanding of who owns that business given the size of the business to not have to uh, collect the BOI report. But a few other exemptions are, you know, inclusive of, you know, banks and other regulated entities. Those businesses are already disclosing with other, um, you know, other government agencies such as the FDIC, for example, um, you know, certain private investment vehicles um, or venture capital funds that are registered as 40 Act companies do not have to file a BOI report. 
Uh, 5013C tax exempt entities mm -hmm. is another one, um, you know, to receive a tax exemption, obviously you, you have to kind of check more than a few boxes to, to get that, um, that benefit, um, certain, certain inactive entities that have truly been dormant for, you know, 12 months or longer, and actually have to meet six different parameters, which I won't unpack, uh, on this, on this co conversation, but happy to follow up for any listeners that have questions around that. So there, there are some some exemptions i think they are um pretty specific and uh ultimately you know millions of companies will will not unfortunately be exempt and thus have to file tens of millions in fact so in other words do your homework to know if you have to file or not is basically what you're saying <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, we have a bunch of great tools on our website, um, such as our BOI quiz. Um, it's free to use. It takes about 10 minutes. Um, it's an interactive experience where you can kind of just jump on uh, the website, answer five or six questions and kind of see if you may or may not need to file a BOI report. Now, we believe 97% of private companies in the United States will have to file a BOI report. So not to uh, kind of ruin the culminating <laughs> culminating moment of the quiz, but um, you know most folks will 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 have to you know file the report. And and the great part about the quiz is it will actually walk you right into filing your report and use all your information that you disclosed in the quiz on the form. So there's no redundancy. Um, and um, yeah, you know this this is something that ultimately I think uh, might be harder to outrun than to necessarily get compliant with. Um, I think a lot of folks have you know obviously by the numbers dragged their feet uh, as as this has gotten rolled out. Uh, still believe a lot of that is due to lack of awareness. Um, so I'm not I'm not kind of stepping over that fact. But, um, you know, six months is going to fly by, you know, between the summer holidays, um, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, I can attest that I certainly don't want to be chasing down uh, my fellow beneficial owners for their IDs over over the Christmas table or or whichever holiday you choose to celebrate around that time of year. Um, so you know, just ultimately trying to spread education, I think, is is really important if you are a, a CPA um, with with a, a book of clients, and also just determining you know is this something that you're going to actually want to do for your clients, or is this something you might deem uh, perhaps unauthorized practice of law, or per perhaps your your professional liability policy not actually covering from an insurance standpoint. So um, McGowan and Pro is actually a pretty prevalently known. Um, uh, insurance brokerage that, uh, you know, insures thousands of, of accountants across the nation. And we've done a lot of thought leadership with them to determine, you know, the right approach for CPAs is if it's best to actually do the work, um, potentially make make a few few bucks kind of distributing BOI services to your clients or even just outsource the work completely uh, to kind of keep an arm's length. And, you know, in either case, file forms can help provide you a workflow solution or be your referral partner, or even some folks just kind of share our website, www.fileforms.com directly with their clients and uh, trust that their clients will, will do it on their own. But a lot of CPAs, you know, they don't want to answer the questions. They don't have enough time to kind of get up the learning curve on this stuff. Um, they're potentially over overwhelmed already with with kind of tax uh, prep services or, or other or other types of, um, you know, services around finance. So, um, you know, you kind of once again, look yourself in the mirror to determine, you know, is this something I'm willing to jump two feet into or is this something I'd, I'd rather just put on the radar of my clients so that they're aware, but then ultimately, um, you know, have the work go to someone like a file forms. So you mentioned just now the, the file, the filing deadlines are looming, you know, correct. What are the, what are the potential consequences for companies? You already mentioned the fines, but are there other consequences that companies could face if they, if they don't file? Yeah, well, let's let's first start with the deadlines. You know, mm -hmm. effectively, all businesses that were formed prior to January first, twenty twenty four, must file their BOI report before January first, twenty twenty five. So that that is kind of six months. If you haven't done it already, if you're just learning about this on your on this podcast today. Um, you have six months to file. So, um, but once again, trying to avoid the the fire drill. Um, you know, trying to avoid folks just forgetting about this completely and getting blindsided by a fine. Now, if you formed a business on January 1st, 2024, or after that date, so any business is formed within the year of 2024, you only have 90 days from your formation date to file your BOI report. So what does that mean? That means businesses formed in January, February, March are starting to all be facing deadlines or past their deadlines and could be accruing fines that are substantial. So we discussed 
Uh, the $591 per day fine that accrues, it goes up to $10,000. Upon it reaching that $10,000 threshold, now there are civil and criminal penalties on the line. So if folks receive that notice that they're getting fined $10,000 for effectively, effectively being delinquent for 18 days, only 18 days, uh, now there's there's potential jail time on the line and other 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 issues. So um, this is this is not something the government's taking lightly, and um, certainly not a, a liability you want accruing on your books. Yeah, you definitely don't. And I'm sure it would be the officers of the organization who would be greatly affected by that jail time. Correct? Yeah, exactly. You know, we're starting to you know see within operating agreements of businesses being purchased this year that um, you know, the beneficial owners of the transaction or the shareholders or the C-suite executives are now ha having to sign in those agreements that they will uh, perpetually you know, report and disclose their information willfully and accurately uh, as a function of being affiliated with that reporting company. So you're starting to see this become part of corporate uh, operations and legal uh, structures and, and contracts within the United States as of this year. So as we look ahead to the future, how do you think this transparency act, the corporate transparency act will impact the business landscape in the long run, you know, for businesses that are being created and just also as it hopefully maybe cleans up some of the, uh, some of the things that they're trying to root out that we mentioned earlier. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, this will quickly become part of forming an entity in the United States. And I say that because actually, I mentioned the 90 day window for newly formed entities um, in 2024, that 90 day window actually shrinks to 30 days in 2025. So if you wow. form an entity January 1st, 2025 or beyond, uh, you'll actually only have 30 days to file your BOI report. Um, so, you know, this is this is going to become more prevalent. I think it's going to become more common practice. I think we're going to break that inertia this year as folks get their initial reports in. And uh, hopefully from this point forward, um, the government will be able to police the, the, the kind of money laundering going on in our nation because they'll have uh, more clarity, more transparency uh, amongst the, the, the private companies in our nation. Well, Frank, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and really explaining all this to our audience. And I encourage everybody to check out the links to file forms. And if you want to connect with Frank on LinkedIn uh, and just ask more questions, please feel free to do so. Um, and Frank, just thanks so much for coming on today. Absolute pleasure, Adam. I uh, really hope we can be as helpful as we can. You know, we work with um, hundreds of attorneys, hundreds of CPAs, a uh, large, large volume of family offices, real estate funds. Um, you know, everyone from kind of the mom and pop business on Main Street all the way to some of the largest uh, legal entity management service providers and kind of business communities, broadly speaking. Um, so we have uh, a direct integration with FinCEN um, for secure filings. Um, you know, we, we do instant filings in 10 minutes. So um, really hope we can be helpful, whether you're choosing to, to do this work on behalf of your clients or ultimately refer the business out. We do offer a revenue share as an option for folks uh, if you're choosing to, to refer business out. Um, so that that certainly could be a, a viable way to kind of monetize BOI without assuming any of the risk. And there's actually no upfront cost for that. So please go onto our website, www.fileforms.com. There's a link to become a partner. You can read about our, our enterprise pro solution or become a referral partner or even just file for, for your firm and give it a shot. So, um, but thank you so much, Adam. This is great. Uh, we're always happy to kind of get on the loudspeaker and, and share as much as we can about this new law. And we do a bunch of events weekly, uh, podcasts, um, webinars, you name it. So we want to give our partners everything they can from marketing collateral to landing pages to, um, you know, thought leadership, broadly speaking, to ensure that they have the answers they need to best serve their clients. So we'll leave it at that. And uh, thank you so much for, for hosting. This has been Count Me In, IMA's podcast, providing you with the latest perspectives of thought leaders from the accounting and finance profession. If you like what you heard and you'd like to be counted in for more relevant accounting and finance education, visit IMA's website at www.imanet.org.